Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and welcome back to the mysterious Trappist-1 system. In this video I wanted to discuss a relatively recent paper from the relatively famous professor who mostly became famous because of his proposal that Oumuamua was most likely a solar sail from an extraterrestrial species or basically some kind of a solar sail. But he also actually has quite a lot of various uh, other proposals, including this one, where he actually almost suggests the opposite. Um, the paper that I'm going to discuss in this video suggests that it's very likely that we're not going to find much life around objects like TRAPPIST-1, at least the type of life that we have on our own planet. In other words, what he suggests is that it's very unlikely that these uh, planetary systems of red dwarfs have any kind of a photosynthetic life. So let's discuss this in a little bit more detail, and if you actually want to check out the paper for this, which was written by Manas V. Lingham and Abraham Loeb, um, it's available in the description below. So what exactly is he saying? Well, he's saying that um, for pretty much most uh, red dwarfs, or at least stars with the mass below about 21% of mass of our sun, they just don't really produce enough visual light, or enough light necessary for what's known as photosynthesis. If you remember your biology back in high school, photosynthesis is how plants produce oxygen, and it's absolutely essential um, for the survival of life on Earth. That's basically how all of the oxygen is made here on Earth, for the most part at least. And um, here in these systems, the star, and in this example it's just going to be TRAPPIST-1, which is about 8% of the mass of our own Sun, um, the type of uh, light that it produces is for the most part infrared. As a matter of fact, even though it actually kind of looks relatively bright here, the sunlight here would be extremely dim. It would be very difficult to see anything, but there would be some heat produced because these stars do have quite um, a lot of infrared emissions. So in that sense, what we have to look at first is the emission spectrum. And um, I wanted to show you the emission spectrum of our sun and compare it to the one from uh, these red dwarfs. So here is what a black body spectrum or the emission spectrum is for different temperatures. And our sun is right here. And as you can see, it produces quite a lot of visible light. And this is actually the intensity of visible light. It also has a little bit of UV and it also has some infrared. Uh, if a star is much hotter, like for example, if, it's, if a star is about 10,000 degrees or, or basically a, a blue giant or a white giant, it will produce a lot of UV, uh, some uh, visual light, and then also some um, infrared, but a lot of it is going to be ultraviolet light. But then if you look at a star like TRAPPIST, whose temperature is only about 2300 degrees Celsius, according to the simulation, in that case, things change a little bit, and the emission spectrum is going to be somewhere below this line here, meaning that it's actually not going to produce um, that much ultraviolet. It's also not going to be producing that much visual light. A lot of the light is going to be in the red spectrum, which is why they're called red dwarfs. But in terms of the actual intensity, it's dramatically lower. This is like 100 times lower. But it does have uh, some infrared light, and a lot of the energy produced is in the infrared spectrum. And so in that sense, it just doesn't produce enough visible light. As a matter of fact, there's another paper I'm posting in the description um, where you can see that the so-called waveband of uh, oxygenic photosynthesis, or essentially photosynthesis uh, but that produces oxygen uh, by you know plants and so on, um, is right here. And for stars that are much cooler than the sun, this band is almost non-existent. In other words, it's actually very, very difficult or borderline impossible for any kind of a photosynthesis to take place in this star system. The light produced here, the infrared light, would be um, enough to produce some heat, but it would not be enough for any kind of a plant or an organism that uses photosynthesis to start producing oxygen. As a matter of fact, uh, the graph right here shows that, um, for the most part, a typical plant or a leaf of a plant is actually reflective in the infrared, meaning that not only is it not going to absorb the energy from a typical TRAPPIST-1 like star, but it's actually going to reflect this energy back and thus not really get much from it. 
And although on the one hand, I guess it kind of sucks that we're not going to be able to find uh, much in terms of potential life on these planets, what's even much worse is that imagine we decide to colonize these planets. Imagine we actually want to go there and turn them into Earth 2.0. Well, unfortunately, because of the types of stars that these are, the actual farms that we decide to plant here, the actual hydroponic farms that we need to survive, similar to what Mark Watney had in The Martian, would unfortunately be kind of impossible now, because the star will just not produce any light necessary for these potatoes or whatever plants we bring to grow. And although this does make future exploration of these star systems relatively challenging for us, there is one caveat, and that's of course the idea of evolution itself. So on the one hand, uh, we have to remember that life was not always the same on Earth. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the first types of photosynthesis on Earth was the retinal photosynthesis. It wasn't the chlorophyll. What I'm referring to, of course, is the so-called purple Earth hypothesis. You can actually learn more about this in the video I made uh, about a year ago. But the idea here is that life will always evolve and life will always find the most efficient way to be even more efficient. And so it's possible that even on these unusual stars, to some extent, life may have evolved to somehow use this infrared light. Like, for example, it's possible that maybe the life around those stars learned to use other materials. So, for example, this right here is vanadium dioxide to somehow harvest energy. This unusual material right here was actually uh, devised in the lab a few years ago, and it turns out that it's, uh, it's good at absorbing IR light, infrared light, almost completely, like almost 100%. In other words, if somehow life finds a way to implement this into its own structure, then maybe it could use the radiation from um, these unusual stars to its own advantage. Obviously, this is very speculative, but there are always ways for life to adapt and to find ways around things. The other major problem with these stars and these planets is that the planets around red dwarfs are almost always tidally locked, meaning that they always have the same side facing the star. That means that one side will always be kind of hot-ish and the other side will be always cold-ish. For this reason, we normally refer to these planets as the eyeball planets. You can learn more about these planets in the video that should be somewhere above my head. But even though on our planet Earth, uh, life is used to having cycles and basically these cycles are necessary for the survival of the life, maybe if there is any life here, it would kind of adapt to not have these cycles or respond to different types of cycles. And this is where we have to start thinking a little bit outside of the box. Sometimes these stars erupt to the extent where the actual flare is dramatically more energetic than um, any other flare even coming from our own sun. In other words, these stars can suddenly increase in various emissions and also increase their temperature. And this can actually happen several times per week. And so in that case, maybe the life on these planets has actually evolved around these unusual cycles. So if suddenly the star increases in its temperature and starts emitting um, the visible light and also the UV light, even if it's only for a few seconds or a minute, it might be enough for these unusual life organisms to absorb enough energy and then wait for the next such event to occur. In other words, maybe just maybe, the life on these unusual planets has evolved to wait for these flares, to, for these very highly energetic events, and to then essentially stay dormant until next event happens. So in, in some sense, it's kind of like the cycle we have on Earth, but it's just very unpredictable and to some extent random. So I really enjoyed reading this paper, but it is kind of limited in its scope right now, and we definitely need follow-up papers that will most likely become available after James Webb Telescope becomes operational and after we get more observations of the type of light emitted by these stars and the type of atmosphere available um, on these planets. I'm sure TRAPPIST-1 is going to be back in the news in the next few years and I'm pretty sure we're going to find some crazy things here that we didn't really know were possible. But until then, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Maybe not the best news for Red Dwarfs, but definitely a really interesting study and a really interesting analysis. Check out the paper in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, and share this video with someone who enjoys watching science videos and wants to learn more about space. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.